Hello and welcome to another episode of G42 on air, produced and recorded from the Mubadala Studios in Abu Dhabi. Today, we're joined by Martin Yates, Chief Technology Officer of Injazad, a G42 company. In his role, Martin is responsible for enhancing Injazad's overarching technology strategy and promoting innovation and industry-leading solutions to support the company's ongoing growth plans. Martin brings over three decades of experience from government, defense, and enterprise delivering digital transformation outcome and now lays out Injazat's future strategic roadmap to growth. Before joining Injazat, Martin was the Global Chief Technology Officer for Smart City, Sustainable and Resilient Nations at Dell Technologies, where he accelerated Dell's global business technology market share. Martin has been a critical part of Singapore's smart nation technology planning, standards, policy, and development, having worked 18 years on government and industry boards. Thank you for joining us, Martin. Thank this you. is great. It's great having you here Thank today. You. Lovely to be here. Martin, we have so much to talk about today. Uh, on smart cities. But before we dive in into this topic, um, can you tell us a little bit more about you, about this great journey moving from Singapore to the United Arab Emirates here in Abu Dhabi with Injazat? Mm. And thank you for the uh, great introduction. Uh, I think you've already covered a lot there already, but um, let me just add a little few items to that. So, um, you know, having worked in Singapore for 18 years, uh, being part of that smart nation journey, there was a lot of lessons learned as we're building that master plan. And of course, you know, myself as the, the global CTO there, uh, covering the world, looking at how cities can transform, uh, what kind of blueprints are needed to be put in place. Um, it, it's a great pleasure for me now to be you know, here in the UAE, uh, working with an amazing company that Injazat is, to be able to now bring many of those lessons learned and embed that in our future going forward. And as you know, Inches out already is a leading light in digital transformation. And with the new models that uh, we are bringing into the Inches at uh, vision, we are planning for really, really uh, fantastic, amazing things going forward. And, and very much uh, whilst we cover all industries, you know, uh, certainly one of our strong ambitions is to improve citizens' lives everywhere in the world, as we start to internationalize our business, we're not just the UAE, we are here to support the world in that transformation, working again in alliance with uh, Injaza and G42 hand in hand together to make the world a better place. Well, this is why we're here today. We're going to be covering the how to make the world a better place uh, through uh, smart cities. So, well, before we dive in, the news we hear about innovation in cities is full of exciting and interesting opportunities, such as public safety, security, mobility, education, healthcare, and you, you name it. But when you say a city is smart, what does that mean? There are many diff uh, definitions for smart city, as you can probably sort of uh, Google, definitely. But, um, you know, for me, uh, it is about uh, a city truly becomes smart when it actually delivers on the promises uh, that leadership have, have made to its citizens and to its business and to its economy. And so with that, that really a, a smart city comes into its own when all the pieces of an ecosystem that make up a city, that make up a nation, mm. are working together in clockwork, in, in synchronicity, to ensure those outcomes are actually being delivered. So integration, uh, trust and, and culture working together is at the core to deliver a, a smart city or indeed a smart nation. When you say smart city, as I know there's so many definitions, but if I want to like somebody, I've been hearing smart city for the last 30 years, you know, or like let's say 25 years of my life. But if somebody who doesn't know what a smart city, how do you, how do you explain to them? Uh, again, there's many, many definitions, but to me, you know, explain that somebody is where all the componentry uh, of a city that delivers outcomes is working together. Now that is essentially underpinned uh, by the technology. Okay. And so those outcomes can never be achieved without putting in the right technology frameworks in place. And this really has been one of the major challenges uh, for city leaderships and, and national leaderships is like, there are so many ways to build this smart city or this smart nation. What should be the architecture? You know, what should be the technology components? And 
how those technology components change over time, because essentially you want to future-proof that city as well. You certainly don't want to, you know, it, it, getting hold of money and, and finance to make those changes is, mm. can be very difficult and challenging. And so you want to future-proof as much as possible going forward. So, you know, again, a smart city is not very smart if it hasn't got its future plan in place that keeps that technology up to date and alive to deliver those citizen outcomes for both government, businesses and the economy itself. Martin, talking about the future, you know, of our cities, um, according to United Nations statistics, 70% of the world population will be living in cities by 2050, compared to, it's also a very big number, which is 50% today. I would assume that 20% um, increase would naturally put a lot of pressure on cities to grow and evolve, while still for us to have uh, attractive uh, lives and uh, a good place to be in. What, what role does technology play here and how does it impact uh, the people in our cities? Uh, that, that's a great question. And, you know, to me, I'm always driven by what is a livable city, what makes that. And that's the, you know, the components of, you know, good mobility, uh, good environment, good education, good healthcare. So all those components are essentially need to be able to come together Mm. to be able to deliver those outcomes. And that, that overall model uh, is essential to put together to be able to deliver uh, that vision that the city leaderships and the governments have put together as their plan for the future. And when we talk about um, the future and sustainability, how would uh, smart cities or technology would impact uh, uh, the sustainability? For example, there are initiatives such as smart energy meters, there is the autonomous electric vehicles, and many others that are directly saving the environment. So when it comes to smart cities, does it intersect with sustainability in terms of consumption of resources? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, from, from your previous question, you know, that... Uh, all this smart technology will be essential because as we move from from the, you know from the, what is already a very high concentration of people in cities mm. compared to many years ago, now you're moving to you know towards a seventy percent uh, population of the world actually living in cities, and these will not be small cities; these will be mega cities. So understanding your resources, understanding your utilization, your electricity footprints, your gas footprints, your, your, your sewage and wastewater systems, your uh, overall waste management strategies are going to be absolutely essential. And if you cannot measure and understand what's happening with your city, then you uh, have no ability to be able to manage those outcomes and put the solutions in place that you need to be able to create that you know, that vision that we have for these smart city outcomes. And so, the, the you know, IoT, and, and you've mentioned this earlier, is going to be an essential component. Understanding what's happening at the very edges of our city, at the very edges of our traffic system, the very edge, edges of our utility systems are all critical to be able to make those vital decisions, uh, both in real time today and both from a planning for the city's future. Um, you know, before we start uh, the the podcast, you were talking about air and how it's going to impact um, the the populations. You'd mentioned something to me about healthcare organization. What was that? Oh yeah, the, this this is something, and I think uh, not so many people are aware of that. But um, you know, the World Health Organization has set a standard of what is you know an acceptable, livable air quality. And, uh, you know, it's, it's quite interesting to find, and again, this is something in public knowledge, public domain, that 91%, close now to 92% of the people of the world today mm. live in unacceptable air quality levels, according to the, the WHO 91%. Standards. 91%. That's, that's big number. And, you know, yeah. if, if solutions are not put in place and mitigation plans put in place, then we're going to be moving to, to even higher numbers. But clearly, you know, 91, 92% is not acceptable. And we all need to, you know, globally need to work on solutions to be able to reduce that amount of pollution. And that can be pollution types of all sorts. It can be the PM type, uh, PM10s, it can be PM2.5. Uh, 
uh, and many other sort of pollutants that are in the. What in does the PM10 and PM? So, so PMs is particular uh, sizes. It's particular um, sizes of uh, particles. Mm. So PM10 is is uh, a larger particle, which is in which can be spent in the atmosphere. But the one that's most interesting is PM2.5, and these are very very small fine particles that are able to enter the body, enter the lungs, and can cause all sorts of types of diseases, you know, lung diseases and uh, cardiovascular type problems. And so, you know, we need to keep a very close eye on the PM 2.5 uh, particulate matters because those are the ones that concern everyone. And, and if you think of the health burden on the world today, uh, it is incredibly important that we manage those uh, those uh, emissions in a, in a very good way. Uh, and how does technology and smart cities um, help in that? So, so the, the technology behind the air quality in particular is, is sensors that will be installed across the city, measuring this, understanding the sources of those pollutions, and how do we mitigate that? So mm. can we improve our construction methods? Can we improve our road standards? You know, can we route roads away perhaps from, you know, uh, high density population areas? What is the switch to electric vehicles? What effect will that have? Are there any number of studies that you can undertake to understand as we move towards electric vehicles, what will be the effect on breathable air within cities? Uh, and so any number of factors uh, that we need to look at and build as models that we understand air pollution and we understand pollutants in general to be able to overcome and put those solutions in place that can make the, the air quality of the world much mm -hmm. better. Because, you know, I, I think you'll agree with me that, you know, 91% is not a good number. I hope that in the future that this number is going to come significantly down. And we've every reason to believe for the technology that's being employed today, that number will come down. I definitely agree with you. And this is where technology comes in. This is where smart cities come in. And and actually, when you, when you mentioned to me that having sensors around the city, I, does, does this also to do with open data when it comes to the data that we need to gather and have more information? How, what, what does it mean when you say open data sharing? I mean, the importance of it for smart cities. Uh, can you shed some light on mm, this sure. significance? So if you think about how a city operates today, it will have, you know, it, it could be, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 different agencies mm. that are responsible for different functions. And they will all be collecting different types of data. In the older pre-smart city model, those data sets would have been kept to themselves. They wouldn't have been shared. Uh, but you never can really get to a smart city if you're not sharing data. You can't make good decisions um, you know, to, to literally go around to each different agency and, and harvest that information manually would take too long. And, and that's is about as far away from smart as you can get. So uh, a smarter city model will always uh, look towards an open sharing data model so that each agency will decide uh, based on its policies and regulations what data can be shared to the community for common good mm -hmm. that you can build and make better decisions on. And that can be for the citizen environment. Citizens can build applications on top of that. Government can build applications on Businesses can build applications on top of that to deliver those outcomes that we've talked about earlier. And so open data is truly a hallmark of a smart city. And, and I've yet to see a, a true smart city without an open data approach. And if you look to you know, those leading cities within the UAE and leading cities in Asia, such as Singapore, you see that open data is core because it is about your trust environment. Mm. And, and without that good trust environment in place, you never really can get those outcomes because your decisions are made on data. And if you don't have that data across the spectrum of your city, you're never truly going to be that you you know, you, you know, utopian kind of smart city of the future. So absolutely a good question. It's absolutely cool. So this is this is only one example with the air pollution being 91 percent and not a very um, good one to, to be. I mean, I'm, actually, this was quite a shock for me, and I'm sure too many of the audience are hearing us now. And it shows how much technology and smart cities could help implement solutions for our future. That brings me to another question. When you spoke about cities like, um, uh, let's say, um, in, in Singapore, or we talk about the United Arab Emirates, Abu Dhabi, uh, Dubai, these are younger cities that are always possibly willing to have this open uh, data sharing. But how about traditional cities? What's the impact in, in yeah. that um, now, places with smart cities? That's a great question, and you know, uh, you know, ha having to sort of um, meet the city leaders across the world, as I've done so in <laughs> in many years, uh, it, it is very much a, a cultural approach. You know, mm. uh, so uh, I find with building 
you know, younger, more modern cities, uh, such as the ones of the many that you see around today, such as uh, Neom in Saudi Arabia, for example, uh, they have the opportunity of a, a clean sheet of paper to be able to draw out that data sharing model, to be able to get agencies to align because they're yeah. essentially all net new. Now, a traditional city such as London or Manchester, for example, uh, they will have the extra challenges because they will have agencies that have traditionally, and we talked about this earlier, their data model sharing is somewhat more reserved. Uh, and they need to do a lot more changes to be able to, first of all, find uh, an architecture that even allows that sharing. And they have to uh, go back to their policies and procedures to undo many of the things that have been put in in, in terms of data sharing for perhaps decades. So it does require a lot more deeper collaboration to build a, a, a smarter, more effective city if you've been traditional. Now, that's not to say it can't happen. And if you look around the world today, you know, that there isn't probably one major city in the world that isn't wanting to be a smart city. Yes. Um, but that, that culture and that attitude to change and the ability to get the stakeholders together is really the essential key to unlocking uh, that city of the future. So. Definitely the younger cities are leading the way and many of the lessons learned and the architectures that are being developed there can actually be also be used by the traditional cities. So a lot of great uh, blueprints can be taken out of the younger cities and reapplied uh, back to the traditional cities. And possibly vice versa when it comes to um, putting policies, regulations, uh, would that also help from traditional cities to impact and support the younger cities with uh, creating um, a better, like for example, let's say a younger city is when it comes to processes, policies, regulations, it's not there yet. Would traditional city be able to help them from that perspective or it wouldn't impact? It's the smart cities and the younger ones helping the traditional cities. I, I, I think it's, um, you know, th there's always the opportunity for traditional cities, especially the ones that have been more uh, faster, uh, yeah. have had the ability to move forward quickly. They would have already had a, a lot of lessons learned in about good governments, um, you know, good government in, in terms of policies. Uh, but of course, you know, I would say that younger cities still uh, drive a lot of that architecture modeling. Uh, however, you know, I have seen uh, real life examples of the traditional cities being able to bring good value into, into that master planning. And there's a lot of lessons that have been learned from history. And I think that's important is that you know, uh, you you look uh, when you're building the vision and that future, look to the traditional cities, look to the younger cities and build the architecture that's right for that for that government or for that city of the day, um, mm. because there's no absolute right or wrong. There's some core practices, um, but uh, the more that's shared and, and that's why you have, you know, the, these uh, organizations across the world that are sharing information about best practices and working together. This definitely covers this part of my question because I always wondered how does younger cities, traditional cities could work together to make the world a better place. Now touching upon artificial intelligence. So um, we did speak about the component of uh, intelligent urban services kind of, but could you uh, tell us what does um, the, um, how can we envision the future of AI when it comes to smart cities? Mm. So AI has been incredibly important in the next evolution cycles of smart cities. A lot of the uh, smart cities didn't necessarily start with too much uh, artificial intelligence built into the fabrics. Um, but over the years, and as AI has matured, that we're able to see that we are not only able to sort of look at what happened and understand from those data trends, um, we're able to see what's happening in real time and we'll be able to use artificial intelligence to make smarter decisions closer to what I call the edge right? In, so that uh, we don't have to wait for a large processing cycle to take place in a core data center. So AI applies across that whole ecosystem of development. And so now you're going to see AI smarter solutions applied to traffic management systems, to we talked about earlier about air quality management mm -hmm. systems. Uh, ultimately, you know, we're going to be using AI applied to digital twin models, where a city is actually built as in its digital form, if you've taken the analog and it's actually built in digital form. And AI can be applied to that, to model the city, uh, to be able to improve uh, what happens if I change the road system. 
Mm. You know, what happens if I change the the way I build my buildings? Uh, if I build tall buildings, small buildings, what happens to the airflow? So AI is incredibly important across that whole life cycle of smart cities to be able to deliver better outcomes. And, and eventually, of course, and, and we'll talk a little bit about later, that will eventually sort of morph itself into the metaverse because the metaverse itself yeah, will consume yeah. much of that data yeah. uh, uh, to be able to deliver different types of outcomes. So AI from a both, you know, understanding what happened in the past, understand what's happening now, being predictive. I know what's going to happen, so I can start putting those manual processes in place, or being prescriptive uh, and having the analytics there, which is that next level. And being prescriptive says, I can predict what's going to happen perhaps uh, on this uh, in this certain situation in a city, uh, and I'll put automatically the processes in place to be able to mitigate that problem before it occurs, so I'm not even having to be reactive. And so that's the, you know, from, from my point of view, the utopian point of view, where all processes in the city mm. are very predictive and very prescriptive. And that's the ultimate automation that you need to get to. Now, everyone's on a different journey to get there. Um, and AI will deliver those outcomes absolutely across that life cycle of a city. You know, it, it makes me think complete something out of this topic, but if we could have some com kind of AI chips in our brains to predict our behaviors of the future, so we know what's going on, could that be possible in 2000? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you probably have to look a little bit to the to the science fiction movies and things yes, like this. Yes, I think this is what's impacting uh, me now. <laughs> um, okay, so we, we covered the, the formula that makes it all possible. We spoke about technologies to citizens, to various organizations that contribute to, the, to benefit from this ecosystem system. But Martin, is there like one single most important component that make smart city solutions a reality? That's a really difficult question because I would say that it has to be a combination of many different factors. I mean, we've already talked you know, heavily about the data, but we also, which we didn't touch on, but uh, needs to be always, as we know, increasingly become digital, we need to look to the security as well. Uh, so I always say that, you know, when building a, a, a smart city or smart nation, security must be a number one priority mm. uh, because clearly uh, we've all seen what happens if, uh, you know, technology is not protected well. Um, so there are multiple factors that need to be taken into account. You know, to me, if, if you really just wanted to sort of pinpoint one factor, I would have to say that all the decisions, all the smartness is embedded in data mm. that must be shared. So, you know, when we do architecture to build the cities of the future, we very much look to that uh, fabric of data sharing. So I very much focus on the how do we share together? How do we share securely? And, and if you get that part right with your stakeholders, you're really, you know, truly that would be a, a, a number one. But again, I, I do mention there's so many different moving yes. parts yeah. to a smart city and smart nation. But it yeah, wouldn't work with the, the one the single sharing, component. Yeah. The sharing fabric is what you must always come back to because that you will build your success on. You've mentioned actually two factors is basically the security and the data sharing and maybe possibly with the cultural, with educa educating people about um, that the data is secured. Citizens feel more comfortable to also share their data. Is that also would help us to develop a faster smart cities when the nation are being involved and educated and more aware of why we require this data to support smart cities de develop faster? Yeah. Again, it really depends on where you're looking to in the world. I mean, okay. there has to be a balance of, of personal uh, privacy, as well as being able to share a certain amount of data that allows, you know, governments and decision makers to be able to make smarter decisions for us. So, you know, that is, you know, as, as you build your architecture, as you build your master plan, you're very much going to sort of take that into account. Um, but again, I do come back to the, the strong point that, uh, you know, if you look at IoT, for example, um, the, you know, initially in a city, you may have started with 10, 20, 100 sensors. Uh, but now, as you as you look to advanced cities, uh, as you see here in the UAE and Singapore, you know, you're going from you know now hundreds to thousands, you know up to the million type sensors, and that's generating a lot of information that needs to have you know sort of better an better analytics. But at the same time, as you increase those number of devices, in a way, you need to think of every one of those devices as little computers themselves. And, um, you know, they have to be protected in the same way that you would protect your, 
your servers and systems within a data center. Mm. So applying security to the edge you know, is incredibly important. Right? And, and if you look to the master planning that we're doing, that is always security at the edge, not just your data center, is the key to true success in a smart city. Which reminds me actually of a project that Njazat is working on with the government, which is basically Al Muhassanat, I believe, the, uh, the 150,000 building that is being secured with sensors. Um, That's right. The, the, this project has been in place for a long time and it essentially uh, secured as a, a, a fire system, civil defense system, and it allows yeah. authorities to be able to quickly understand and detect uh, fires that are happening and be able to immediately connect the stakeholders, the emergency services to respond very fast uh, yeah. to those um, uh, situations that occur. You know, and going forward, you know, that's just the very beginning. I think the exciting part is now where do we take that in future to ensure, again, you know, better safety and security for citizens and for residents of commercial buildings and, and much more beyond that. So we're, we're really excited about that technology that's already up and running today, delivering results and you know, the sky's the limit of where we can take that to deliver better citizen outcomes. Martin, what are um, the kind of technologies that could be involved in, in smart cities? There are numerous different technologies that need to be employed to deliver the outcomes that we've you know, been talking about. And of course, you know, essentially you know, cloud computing core will be uh, essential to bring all the data points together. Uh, we've talked a little bit, of course, on the IoT, uh, all the thousands of sensors that need to bring uh, data uh, from the edges to make better, smarter decisions around the city. We've talked a little, a little about the edge computing and edge computing is a, a relatively new term where we're making analytics uh, and making smarter decisions the, at the edge of where data is being generated. How does that happen? How what does that happen is, is a great question. So if you think about like, uh, you know, different types of camera technologies, different types of signaling technologies, mm -hmm. different types of air uh, sensor quality measuring tools, uh, they are producing huge amounts of data. Uh, now you don't want to essentially send all of that data back to the back to the, the essential uh, cloud. Uh, you will want to be able to process a lot of that at the edge and you want to be able to scan what information is actually important. Now, knowing that there's so much volume of data, what really do I need to make decisions? And so that essentially the edge computing is, is absolutely okay. essential in that fabric as you build that city. Mm. And you know, applying of the artificial intelligence to that uh, edge computing that we believe we've talked about earlier, as well as being able to you know, ensure that you have those digital twins in place uh, that fully replicate the scenario of a city or a set of processes. And so, uh, having that underlying data processing core, that what we essentially call that big data, and the security that ensures that that data is being secured for city use and for decision making use and for the overall councils and all the different authorities. You know, that's absolutely essential that uh, we have an in, in integrated and good governance on all of that various different data. So technologies are absolutely essential to ensure that all of that is delivering the outcomes that mm. we require. If you want to give me an, an actual example on ground, can you give me an example of how is this technology being implemented in smart cities and how is that impacting our cities? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, a, a really great project that we can reference here, for example, is the Injazad Hassantuk solution, which is a, a, a private public uh, partnership uh, between um, the MOI and the Civil Defense Force, which essentially allows for us to be able to monitor, you know, potentially, and actually is in place, monitoring thousands of buildings, uh, looking at the fire detection systems, and these are all IoT devices. Uh, we need to process that data and bring that into a command and control and into an alerting command and control system that alerts the authorities in case of incidents, so being much more proactive uh, and actually being able, therefore, to deliver on public safety and, and deliver better outcomes and actually save lives and save property would be a, a fantastic. And there are many more examples that we can quote, um, but essentially that would be a, a good example where all of those pieces come together, where the IoT comes together, where the artificial intelligence comes together, where the cloud comes together, and those essential network fabrics that be able to connect those different sources of data. Mm. This is a great example. You know, we always like to hear safe city, and that's how we feel in the United Arab Emirates. Um, 
And now, Martin, my, my let's say, last question for today. Um, let's propel ourselves on only a few years for, forward, um, just 40 years from now in 2050. <laughs> just a few years. <laughs> just a few years. Okay. <laughs> we'll still be very young. What would a smart city look like? And what would it offer its citizens? What would a smart city look like? So on the basis that we have put the right technologies in places, that we are able to mitigate many of the risks that we talked about earlier, so that we're able to reduce the, you know, the, the air pollution, that we're able to improve uh, various different levels of, of water quality, uh, food security. These are essentially the outcomes that we're looking for. And I do believe that using these technologies will bring the uh, outcomes that we need to be able to deal with those future population increases, as well as the, the fact that we've seen that, you know, in, in recent years, we've gone from climate change to climate crisis. And, and of course, using these technologies, we were able to be able to mitigate um, and offset many of those things that would have been a severe challenge. So mm -hmm. I do see a, a very optimistic future uh, using technology to be able to deliver the outcomes that we need for, uh, for ourselves, for our families, uh, for our cities, for our country, and most importantly, of course, for the whole planet. So um, a lot of great optimism in, in that technology platforms uh, that are being deployed and being used. And we've just got to keep focused on that and we've got to do more and more uh, focus on the outcomes that we're looking for as one, as a, essentially as one, one city, one nation, one planet. What a beautiful way of looking at it and ending it. Thank you so much, Martin. That was beautiful. And I love the optimism outlook. Uh, and it's definitely true when we are going to be implementing this kind of technology and supporting each other, it, it will have a huge influence on our planet. So once again, thank you so much that I've learned so much about smart cities. I've learned a great deal on technologies and I'm sure the audience also did so uh, I hope to see you in the future and I hope to see you in, in Abu Dhabi offices also within Jazad and see more about your projects that you're working on. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure today. And of course, I do uh, openly welcome you to come and take a look at these technologies. It's absolutely amazing. And again, thank you. Uh, been a great pleasure to talk to you today and the audience out there on, on this particularly important topic. Thank you. I'll see you in 2050 <laughs> and we'll talk about further technologies. Yeah, I'll see you then. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. Thank you. That brings us to the end of the show. Thanks to Martin for joining us on this episode of G42 On Air. We hope that this conversation has been insightful in helping you understand beyond the headlines of smart cities. Thanks for listening to G42 On Air. If you enjoy our show, please rate and review us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And be sure to come back next time. Until then, this is May Sayyid Ali signing off from Abu Dhabi.